ಸುತಿಸ್ಮೃತಿಪುರಾ ಆಲಯ ಕರುಣಾಲಯ ನಮಿ ಭಗವತ್ಪಂಕರ ಲೋಕಶಂಕರ so in the last two classes on vivek churamani we were just having an introductory discussion on the entire scope of vivek churamani that what all subject it deals with that in a nutshell we tried to have a discussion so today we will enter into the text of the vivek churamani verse by verse so the verse this the book as is the tradition for any of the prakarana grantha for any of the treatises is that it starts with some invocation the salutations to the god so here also the book begins with bhagavat pada shankaracharya salutation to god and the first verse is so constructed the invocatory verse the first verse is so constructed that it also means salutations to his own guru so in 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 a way he has constructed that at the same time when he is offering his salutations to god he is also offering his salutations to the to his guru govinda pada who was the guru of shankaracharya so gauru pada's disciple is govinda pada that's the lineage and govinda pada's disciple is shankaracharya so the gauru pada who wrote the karika mandukya karita karika his disciple is govinda pada and govinda pada's disciple is shankaracharya so this the name govinda comes in the invocatory verse in such a way that govinda means god the lord krishna the govinda and also his own guru so by using the word govinda he is actually uh, indicating both the supreme godhead as well as his guru so what the first verse is let us enter into the first verse sarva vedanta siddhanta gocharam tam agocharam govindam paramanandam sadguru pranato as, asmyam asmi aham pranato asmi aham sarva vedanta siddhanta gocharam tam agocharam govindam paramanandam sadguru pranato asmi aham so what's the meaning that i bow down to my sadguru to the eternal guru govinda sadguru means the eternal guru in sanskrit the word sad as as we as we have again and again indicated means that which is trikal avadhita which was which is which will be god alone is the trikal avadhita satya so by using the word sadguru here shankaracharya is indicating the lord it is the human guru is just the channel through which the eternal divinity is working so here he is offering his oblations his pranams to the sadguru that is the eternal guru who is govinda he is the embodiment of supreme bliss paramanandam sadguru so all so here in this verse the line is that i bow down to my the lord pranat sadguru pranato asmi aham the rest all are all the adjectives to that sadguru so who is that sadguru who is beyond thought and speech agocharam so tam agocharam he is beyond the thought and speech and he is the goal of all vedantic truths sarva vedanta siddhanta gocharam so god alone is the supreme guru the ultimate reality it is he who instructs human kind through the channel called the human guru it is the god who imparts to us the supreme knowledge about himself through a human agency and therefore the human being is also said to be a guru in secondary sense 
the guru is the very embodiment of the supreme divinity this human guru we shouldn't look at him as an ordinary human being he is the very embodiment of the supreme divinity and he is the bridge between the disciple and the god he is like just like a matchmaker he is the most adorable one among human beings and shankaracharya is seeking the blessings of both both of the human guru his guru govinda pad as well as govinda by the word govinda he means the ultimate reality to both his offering his oblations so what are the essential features of god to whom shankaracharya is offering his prostrations that as has been indicated in this shloka the first is tam agocharam that god is beyond the reach of speech and mind the mind cannot comprehend him because he is beyond the mind he is the one who makes the mind appear to be conscious the mind by itself is inert it is a conscious principle behind the mind which makes the mind appear to be conscious so he is beyond the mind and he is naturally beyond the speech anything which is beyond the mind cannot be expressed through speech so he is tam agocharam our sense organs and the mind cannot reveal that truth then the question comes how the thing which is unknown how can we know him how can we realize him so in the same verse it is shankaracharya is indicating sarva vedanta siddhanta gochar so yes he is not revealed through the senses he is not revealed through the mind he is not revealed through the speech but he can be realized from the import of the entire vedanta the entire vedanta vedanta is like an indicator it is pointing to that truth the truth cannot be spoken of but there is a pointer the vedanta is the pointer is an index by studying which we can get an idea how to proceed in our spiritual journey so that we can realize that ultimate truth the ultimate truth is something which is ineffable means it cannot be described but those who have realized it they know for certain with conviction that there is the self which is beyond this mind and speech so that is something noetic it gives you a very very strong conviction as in the aratrikam song which we were singing just now that gata sangshaya drira nischaya the one who goes to that realization he goes beyond all sangshaya all doubts drira nischaya he becomes established in conviction so it is something noetic noetic you know that you have known the truth as sri ramakrishna used to say what it cannot be explained as sri ramakrishna used to say kamon ghi na jamon ghi the one who have tested the clarified butter he knows what the clarified butter taste like but can he explain impossible you cannot explain the taste of clarified butter so he is using that as an example so there is something which can be experienced but which cannot be explained it is inexplicable but at the same time it is something which can be experienced and for that experience vedanta is the indicator it shows us the way even the word govinda also means sarva vedanta siddhanta gocharam how in sanskrit the word go means vani the teachings which again indicates the teachings of vedanta and govinda means one who can be attained through the teachings of vedanta govinda the go the teachings which can lead me to that ultimate truth so this govinda the word itself speaks of the phrase sarva vedanta siddhanta gocharam so he is the one who is not who cannot be comprehended through the mind through the senses but at the same time it is not total he is not unknowable the vedanta the scriptures are there to show us the way to realize him and once we realize we know that he is of the nature of supreme bliss paramanandam <clears throat> that has been spoken of in the first verse so very nicely he has constructed the first verse this idea of invocation always we find in the scripture is there where uh, the blessings of the divine is being invoked 
so that the work becomes successful, that Shankaracharya is going to write a treatise on Advaita Vedanta, that his endeavor may be successful. For that, he is invoking the divine through this invocatory verse. Now we will enter into the second and the third verse, where Shankaracharya captures the deep implication of this human birth, the birth in the human body, that we shouldn't miss the opportunity. It's a great opportunity to be born as a human. We have been in the Vedantic scriptures, the idea is that we have we were transmigrating to so many births and at last we got this human birth. It's something very precious. As per our spiritual journey is concerned, it is something very precious. We shouldn't lose the opportunity of all the spiritual unfoldment that can happen with the help of this body. So that will be implied in the second and in the third verses. The infinite possibilities which is hidden in every human being. He is making us aware of that. So let us go to the second verse, what he is saying. Jantunang nara janma durlabha mataha is among all the creatures of living beings. Nara janma, the birth as a human being is something durlabha, is something which is not prevalent. It's something which is very precious. You must be, you must have done a lot of pious deeds to get this human birth. So it is durlabha mata. It is not something easily attainable. Yes, yeah, so it is difficult for the living beings to obtain this human birth. That's the first thing. And then he will be just speaking of the sequence by which we will find that it is harder, more and more difficult to get the higher things. It's like a hierarchy. First, to get the human birth itself is very difficult. Then he will speak of something which from the present day scenario, from the present society may appear to be highly objectionable. He's saying something that first, the human birth is precious. It is very difficult to get. Next, he's saying is pungstwang, the male body. So he's giving as if more credit to the male than the female. So we will come to it. Why he's saying that? So it is very difficult first to get the human birth and then to be born as a male human being. Tato viprata and then as a brahmin. So all this from the present, if we read it very superficially, it all appears to be very, very objectionable from the present day uh, social uh, standards. It's very difficult to understand. We have to understand from which standpoint he's saying it, and then we will find what he's saying do make sense. So first let us have the literal meaning of what he's saying. That first the human birth is something very difficult to get, and then the male body, and then to be born as a Brahmin. Tasmat Vaidika Dharma Marga Parata. And even if you are born as a Brahmin, you may not be inclined to the spiritual way of life. Vaidik Dharma Marga Parata. That the spiritual way of life, as has been indicated in the Vedas, the Dharma, the way to Dharma, the path, the Marga, as has been indicated by the Vedas. We may not be inclined. You may be born as a Brahmin, but you may not be inclined. So, it is even harder to have that inclination to follow the spiritual path. So again we say that first a human birth is difficult, then to be born as a male be human being, and then it's more difficult to be born as a Brahmin. It is like the Abraham Maslow's uh, that, uh, the hierarchy of needs, and then to be inclined, to have that inclination towards uh, spirituality that is still more uh, difficult to have. We find there are many Brahmins, those, those who have the scope for spiritual evolution. In the present day, even I can say that even if you just, in the present day situation, the monasteries are there, so, so many uh, channels are there in your internet where the spirituality is being described, spoken of, the various path has been spoken of, so many gurus, how many people find inclination to really avail to that? 
so that's the that's being indicated by tasmat vaidik dharma marga parata and then even you have the inclinations towards dharma you may not be sufficiently intelligent to really understand the subtleties of that part so vidvatvam the intellect the next it comes asmat param the, the intellect comes next and then even if you have the intellect it may be diversified it may get engaged in something which has nothing to do with your spiritual life so even if you are a very vidwan a very intelligent person and then again it's still harder still difficult to have atma anatma vivechana the first criteria for entering the spiritual journey the discrimination between the self and the non self that again is still harder to get and still harder even if you have this faculty of discrimination but to lead to realization to get established in that realization swanubhava brahmatmana sanskriti swa anubhava to have that self realization and after that having that realization to always fill the identity of yourself with the absolute self brahma atmana sanskriti that identity is still more difficult but if you cannot reach that that apex swanubhava brahmatmana sanskriti which speaks of liberation unless you can reach that know it for certain the last line is indicating muktirno shat janma koti sukritai punnai vina labhyate so to get all this thing that to reach that state of brahmatmana sanskriti by first to get the male body uh, first to get the human birth then there is a male human being then as a brahmin and then inclinations to a spiritual path and then have sufficient intellect to understand the intricacies of this path and then to have the discrimination leading to the realization this is possible those few fortunate ones who we find in this earth have reached the state it is possible only through shata janma koti through millions of birds of pious deeds so it is that precious that's what the thing which shankaracharya is indicating in the second verse now let us enter into the verse in a more detailed uh, description that why he is giving importance to the male body to the state of brahminhood to be born as a brahmin what he actually is indicating let us try to understand from his perspective from the social upbringing in which he was born the social uh, circumstances in which he was born if we have to take it from that standpoint and then try to understand what is saying so first jantunang nara janma durlabha matah so it is very rare for living beings to obtain the human birth you may say that there are so many animals getting extinct we are 8 million population now how come we are rare we are huge but you will be surprised to know that in your human body just as a human being we are constituted of 30 trillion human cells but our microbiome that means apart from, means from the we are constituted of these human cells but there are many microbes who are coexisting with us within our body you will be surprised to know each human being has 30 million trillion human cells that constitute him and we think most probably the uh, microbiome that the microorganisms who habitate in our body they must be less they are there but they exceed the human cells they are 39 trillion about 9 trillion microbial cells more than even our own cells as per weight they may be 1, 1 to 2% because they are simply small microbes but their population is even greater than the human cells so just in each human being the microbes exceeds the entire human population 39 trillion in a pond if you go you take a if you take the mi- microbial po- population of the entire pond it will by some 10 times 20 times 30 times even more it will exceed the human population so if you take the living beings all together we are just a some uh, 
a very very trivial amount and number is the human being so it is very rare to get a human birth and even you just leave out the number if you take the faculties with which we are born that again speaks of the rarity we are endowed in here as we are dealing with the spiritual aspect we forget the other aspect even to born as a human being that we are the only wing as sri ramakrishna used to say manushi ekmatro jeev je ishwar chinta korte pare that human being is the only being who can think of god that again speaks of the preciousness of the human birth he used to say ramakrishna used to say manush means man plus hush that man man speaks of the certain faculties which we have as a human the uniqueness which we have as a human there are certain faculties and hush means the awareness sometimes we ourselves are not aware of those faculties if you are aware of those human faculties then only the question of exploring those faculties come so what one of the special man is that we are the being who can think of god the god is a very broad term means who can think of the spiritual dimension of our existence so as a human being now we can understand the preciousness of the human birth it is something like the apex of a pyramid if the entire pyramid signif- uh, signifies the living the uh, biodiversity the all the living beings then the human being is the apex it is the topmost portion as well as it is the narrowest portion that's where the human being is concentrated that much so it is very something rare to be born as a human being it's a great blessing that we born as a human being the next thing which we were saying is very controversial is then to be born as a male member of the human being so immediately the question comes is shankaracharya discriminating by saying that the female where the female doesn't have the scope of spiritual unfoldment so now we have to understand this point from its proper perspective so it has been noticed in the past even in the present day that whenever there is a this political conditions become chaotic foreign invasions are there foreign invasions takes place when the crime increases in the society it's obvious the women it is always happens at the cost of the women's freedom women will be always what you say that enclosed within their own household they cannot go out their fear freedom is curtailed whenever there is there is a chaotic condition in the society they are the first one to get affected and when shankaracharya was born that was the situation there the foreign invasions have started and the vedic society where if you read the vedas there you find the women had full freedom not a single yagya could be done where the female is not there that for any yagya it has to be done by a married man married person and he has to be accompanied by the wife he is sahadharmini she is sahadharmini nothing can be done without her and even in this higher spiritual journey we find many brahmavadinis in the vedas in the vedantas it is mentioned that they have reached that pinnacle of the spiritual journey the gargi maitrei there are so many brahmavadinis in the vedanta in the vedas so it speaks that the women do have that faculty to attain that high spiritual height but by the time of shankaracharya we find because of the foreign invasions political disturbance increase of crime in the society the women's freedom is curtailed and now the avenues to seek higher things in life all naturally becomes restricted so if you take the it is not the potentiality for which shankaracharya is saying that the females are had do not have that scope for spiritual evolution as per potentiality they do have but as per the social restrictions the scope is no more there the opportunity is no more there they cannot avail that because they have now been restricted within the household they cannot go to the guru griha the social system the structure has become such so 
taking into consideration the contemporary society in which Shankaracharya is writing this treatise, we do understand that why he is indicating that, that it is the male who have the greater scope. That way he is not in any way saying that woman cannot. But the opportunity is not there. To become a medical student, I have to go to the medical college first. And if some are filtered out, they cannot go, though they are capable, how can they become a doctor? So if to become a doctor, first you should be capable, you should have the qualifications, sufficient skills to be a student there. But if I have filtered out for some reason, I am not allowed to go to the medical college, how can I become a doctor? So the social system was such that in spite of the inner potentiality which the female has, where Shankaracharya is in no way restricting by saying that they as such, they are not capable. The social structure won't allow them. So they won't get the scope. So that's why he's saying that to be born in that type of society, as a male member, you do have a better opportunity. So that's why he's saying it's much rarer to be born as a male being, male human being, because they have a better scope for pursuing the spiritual journey. And then he again speaks of Viprata. Again, we may say that he's speaking of something which is highly objectionable. He's speaking of a caste-ridden society where the Brahmin alone has the right to read the Vedas, not the others. Now again, we have to understand the perspective from which he's saying that. Now how this caste developed? The initial uh, development of the caste system do speak of the growth in civilization, that how the caste developed, system developed. It's not only in India, throughout the world, the caste system is there. But how it became a necessary evil, that we will try to understand. That, you know, that as a human being, our ancestors were the food gatherers. They used to go to the forest to this pick fruits, roots, herbs, and that was their uh, means of sustenance. But in the process of evolution, they learned agriculture. And now agriculture brought laser. That only for few months I cultivate, I get the crops, I get the yield, and I store them now rest of the year, I need not, now need, I need not have to go to the forest every day to collect my food. The food is already there. So what do I do? So with the laser comes culture. A group, so that what's all this music, art, literature, all this has developed how it's all the product of your laser. So what to do with the laser? Then this culture starts developing. And now, it's not only the arts and other things. We will find a group of people are introspective about the reality of nature. That what's the meaning behind the existence? What's the cause behind the existence? So they became introspective. And they, this, this, those who were introspective about the reality of the nature, they were contemplative. They were always uh, leading a life of contemplation. And they evolved they evolved into this, this particular caste, which we call as Brahmin. They evolved, who continued that culture as a family. And now, the family lineage came, that when you develop a particular trait, it passes on to your next generation, to your children. Now, when that becomes crystallized, that becomes a necessary evil now. In the beginning, we will find, even in Bhagavad Gita, it is mentioned, that all the caste is this is based on the gunas. Nowhere it is mentioned it is based on janma, on birth. But somehow it became crystallized later to become as an evil of the society. But whatever it is, that's the fact that those who were contemplative by nature, they passed on their traditions to their family and now it was restricted within that family. Others had no scope for all the knowledge which they have accrued through generations, others have no scope. Only they are the one who are the hirers, who are the inheritors of that knowledge. So naturally, 
from that social perspective it's again not that the other caste people cannot be religious cannot have spiritual evolution it's not the potentiality which shankaracharya is speaking of it is the existing social structure in where the brahmin naturally have the advantage because all the knowledge is restricted within that caste so naturally it is they who have the advantage who have the scope not for as a potentiality but as for the availability of that resource they are born in an environment where they have that potentiality to grow and that's what shankaracharya is indicating so viprata so when first you are born as a human being and then as a male member and then as a brahmin now you can go to the guru griha you can have the knowledge all these are accessible to you for others it is not accessible in that society it is not that shankaracharya is descripting he is just taking the society as a matter of fact and in that society what is possible that he is speaking it's a matter of fact that was the society then so now he comes that even after getting all these opportunities it's up till now it speaks of daiva that i don't have the what you say that uh i cannot decide that what will be my birth i am born as a human being it is not my decision i am being born my past karma whatever it may be has enabled me to be born as a human being so it is daiva it is not something which depends on my endeavor to be born in a male body that is also daiva to be born as a vipra who can have the uh, scope of that knowledge he is that is also daiva but next comes the purushartha your own endeavor what is that tasmat vaidik dharma marga parata that inclinations towards that religious path if you don't have that with all the scopes which you already have the environment which you have nothing will be of any avail so we say that karma actually doesn't speak of what we get we say because of my past karma i have been born in such a situation or i have been born in a good situation or in a bad situation and we think that there the there the karma's uh, role ends no karma doesn't speak of what one what we get but it also speaks of what we do with what we get that we give a common example lord is this example is used even in uh, the in the business in the world of management that example what is the example is the example of cooking suppose you are a rich person and you have the all the resource the amenities for all the ingredients which will enter in a good dish you have access to all of that and someone else is a very poor person he cannot buy all those spices all those thing but the one who is rich who is having access to all the ingredients may not be a good cook with all those resource may will, will that won't be of any avail but the other person with this little resource he has he has developed the skill of cooking he can cook a very wonderful dish out of it so karma is not what you have what you get but what you do with what you have he we have or what you have what you get so here comes the smart vaidik dharma marga parata so by the good karma we may be born in a good environment as by being a brahmin we may have all the resources like the access to the vedas you may be intelligent that is vidvatvam that has also been uh, uh, counted as an attribute here and but you have no inclination to the practice that is vaidik dharma marga parata you have no inclination or towards the discrimination atma anatma vivechana you don't have inclination then our environment is of no avail so that's first he speaks of those three and factors which speaks of the environment in which you are born and then speaks of your inclination that even for higher studies we find that it is because of our grades we can get chance in some particular professional course but once we get admitted that's not the all now the one who is really passionate about that studies 
he can excel. The others, though, are in that same university, same environment, won't in any way benefit from their stay there. So how? what's the passion you have? That's important. First, to get the scope is also is a big factor. And once you get the scope, now it speaks of your inclination, your yearning, your passion to really excel. So that's why that Vaidik Dharma Marga Parata has been spoken of. So this Vaidik Dharma Marga Parata is the thing which speaks of your Purushartha, your own inclination. And that can lead to, and ultimately if you have this, this Vaidik Dharma Marga Parata, inclinations towards the spiritual journey, following the scriptural path, leading to discrimination of the self and the non-self, which still further it leads to the realization, Swanubhava, Brahmatpana Sanskriti. So, that's the thing which is being indicated here. That unless we have that, the spiritual realization cannot happen even if we are born in all the favorable circumstances. So here Sankaracharya one by one is what he's saying is in sequence. That even after Vaidik Dharma Marga Parata, you may be an intelligent person, Vidvatvam, but that doesn't entail in spiritual realization. Why? To understand that Vidvatvam, uh, uh, Atma Anatma Vivechana is something rarer than intelligence. The discrimination of self and non-self is something of precious, more precious, rare than Vidvatvam. It is higher in sequence. Why? There's a nice story in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna that there was a Bhagavata Pandit, a scholar of Bhagavata, and he was appointed by the king that the king asked that appointed the Bhagavata Pandit, the scholar in Bhagavata, to every day come and expound the scripture to him and explain to him. So he used to come, the Pandit every day used to come and expound the Bhagavata scripture for about an hour or maybe a couple of hours to the king and after doing that he did it with full sincerity but after that he will every day ask the king so king I tried my best to explain you about this scripture the Bhagavata what is being what the contents of the Bhagavata I tried to explain to you have you understood and the king after hearing after giving a very intent hearing to what has been said he will say, first you yourself understand. Now this perplexed the Bhagavata Pandit, that why the king every day says to me that first you understand. And then suddenly it striked him one day, that the entire Bhagavata speaks of only one thing, and that is Atma Anatma Vivechana, that this world is trash, it is unreal, God alone is real, hold on to God, renounce the world. And now I, for getting a petty salary, every day go to the king to get that salary, I am expounding Bhagavatam. So the question comes, have I understood the Bhagavatam? Because the import of Bhagavatam is hold on to God and renounce the world. And I am explaining Bhagavatam just to get that few pecuniary benefits. And it strike, this moment this idea striked him, he immediately developed a tremendous renunciation. He left his hearth and home. No one knew where he has went. But before leaving, he just wrote something on a paper and asked someone to deliver it to the king. When the Bhagavad Pandit was not found anywhere, the king got that small letter in which just one line was written. Now I have understood the import of Bhagavatam. So Vidvatvam. So here you will find that why Atma Anatma Vivechanam is something rarer is something more precious than Vidvatvam. You may be a wonderful expounder of the scripture, but you are yet to develop that power of discrimination. Then that Vidva, that, vid, that Vidya, that knowledge is of no avail. So that's why that it is still harder to have that Atman, Atma Vivechanam compared to that vid, Vidya, with the knowledge. And still harder to have that realization. You may have developed that discrimination, but you are not uh, sincere enough, you are not endeavoring enough, you are not yearning enough to go to that realization. Till that realization happens, all the knowledge is mere intellectual knowledge. It may give us a feeling, oh I have read the scriptures, 
I am always discriminating between the self and the non-self. I know I am the Atman, everything else is the non-self. And I may be very much satisfied that I have understood the implications of the scripture. But what's the best way to find out that you have, whether you have really found out the implication of the scripture? When there is crisis in life. When there is, uh, life is full of perils. Can I be still be detached? Can I still say that I am not in any way affected by the troubles of life? As Sri Ramakrishna used to say very nicely that however you may go on saying that I am the Atman, when a thorn pricks you, you immediately shout, you immediately feel the pain that speaks of your identification with the body. Why that happens? Because this Atma, Anatma, Vivechana may, this the discrimination between the self and the non-self, may just remain in the intellectual level. It has not taken us to the realization. And then all that knowledge is of no avail. As Swami Vivekananda used to give the allegory of that stag, a male stag, a male deer, was very strong, had very strong muscles. His limbs were very, very muscular. One day he was standing near a reservoir and seeing his own reflection. And he was, what you say that, full of pride. He was bragging to the young one, the fawn, just beside him. Beside him. See how strong I am, how well built I am, how muscular I am. And then from nowhere they heard the, this, the stag heard the barking of a dog. And it started running frantically. The fawn also followed it. After a long distance, it stopped. It was totally exhausted. The fawn was surprised. You were so confident seeing your reflection. You were so confident about your strength. What made you run? What made you so scared that you were running frantically? And then the stag replied, I don't know what happens to my confidence when I hear the barking of a dog. So in our life also we find that unless the Atma, Anatma, Vivechana takes us to that Swanubhava, self-realization, and not only that, that self-realization has again to be ripened into Brahmatmana Sanskriti, to be in that state of existence where you always fill your identity with absolute reality. Then that Atma, Anatma, Vivechana is of no avail. It doesn't help you when you need it. It is just like a knowledge which is in the book. It is just like a wealth which is in the other's hand. Karya Kalena Samutpanne. That, that very famous Sanskrit sloka is there, that couplet. That uh, this uh, Pustakastha Vidya and Parahastha Gatadhanam. The knowledge which is in the book and the wealth which is in the other's hand. Then when the need is Karya Kale in a Samut that when it, the need is tat vidya tat dhanam, that, that knowledge, that wealth is of no avail. So all our knowledge, unless it has been internalized, it has went to that state of realization, is of no avail. It is something which is just like a bookish knowledge. So now the sequence actually speaks of the rarity of that type of knowledge but that's what we have to approach. Just the way reaching to the apex of the mountain, to the peak of the mountain is very difficult. There's only a few who can do that, but it is not impossible. That many may fail, but that doesn't deter the one who is aspiring to climb the mountain. So many fall, so many will be falling, so many will be dying. And those dead bodies will become the landmark for the next climber to find out the way. So that's the thing Shankaracha is indicating. That is difficult. That many may fail, but that doesn't mean that it should deter us from, from this journey. Why? Because as the Vedanta says, Nanya Pantha Vidyati Yanaya. There is no other way by which we can reach that fulfillment. That's the only way. It's, so it's, though it's difficult, it's not impossible. If it was impossible, then there was no need to pursue it. There was no need for the pursuit of the spiritual journey. It is possible. It's not impossible. Very difficult. 
but it is possible. So this rarity speaks of the, uh, what you say, that the, the path's difficulty, but at the same time it speaks of that there are few who have reached there. I can also reach. So that's the motivation behind it. That though it is hard, but it is possible. So the same theme continues again in the next verse, the third verse. What? Durlabham trayam eva etat. Durlabham trayam eva etat. What are, there are three things which is very, very rare. Durlabham. It's not easy to get. You can get it only by the anugraha of the daiva. Deva anugraha hai etukam. By the blessings of the divine you may get. It's not in your hand. What are those three things? Manushyatvang, Mumukshutvang, Mahapurusha Sangsraya. To get this, not the human body only, Manushyatya, to be aware of this human faculty by which you are born, that's the human faculties which can take you to the spiritual realization. So to be, to be a human being who is aware of these faculties and then you should be Mumukshu, you should have developed that yearning you have to have developed that yearning and it should lead you to that a illumined soul who can show you the way out. Mahapurusha Sangsraya. This sloka reminds us of Swami Vivekananda's state, mental state. When he was in Kashipur, in gospel it is mentioned that one day he is having a conversation with M. He is saying, just see my condition that I have got the Mahapurusha Shangsraya. This I, I am in the feet of Ramakrishna. I am a human being, Manushatya. But when that yearning will develop, that tremendous yearning, which will lead me to that realization, that it already speaks of that yearning has developed. Otherwise, he wouldn't have spoken of that. He feels the need of that more intense uh, yearning. So that's what he was saying. So these are the three factors. Manushatya, Mumukshatya, Mahapurusha Sangsraya. Manushatya speaks of the scope in which you are placed. Yearning speaks of that, the uh, what you say, the development, the possibilities of development which is possible after you get that scope. And then you of course need the teacher, the Mahapurusha, the one who has already traversed that path was an illumined soul. So these three are the things which is very durlava and which are again the essential things for a spiritual journey. So what it is speaking of? Manushatya first. So why as a human, this uh, human being this is called something very precious, the human life is durlava, something precious. Swami Vivekananda very nicely in his complete works he have he used an allegory to explain the preciousness of the human birth. So he's saying, with a very simple example, that you cannot see your own face except in a mirror. And so the self cannot see its own nature until it is reflected and this whole universe, therefore, is the self trying to realize itself. The universe is like the mirror. The infinite Atman, as it were, is trying to see his own face and all form and all from the lowest animals to the highest of gods are like so many mirrors to reflect himself. And he is taking up one by one this mirror and finding them insufficient until he finds the human body as a mirror. This is the best mirror where you can get the exact reflection of God. So until this is the human birth in the human body, he comes to know that there cannot be any expression of the infinite in the finite. So with the Manushatya, what happens? Sri Ramakrishna, Swami Vivekananda is giving this example, this best mirror, which we can understand with the idea of evolution. Just see when the self first finds expression as a living being, as a micro. In the micro, what has happened? The self has been reflected in the micro to give the micro a feeling, give a feeling that I am this small creature. It is the self which is reflecting through that micro. Now, something is echoing behind that micro, that you are infinite. 
you're eternal. But the microfinance, it's not eternal. It's little change in the environmental uh, parameters will result its annihilation. So now it starts struggling, that how to struggle against the nature. And he's trying to express that, find the expression of that eternal thing which is echoing behind him. Some, the self is saying, you're eternal, you're eternal. And that echo is heard through this micro body and it thinks the micro body is eternal and is trying to express that echo through that body. And that's what results in the biological evolution. A single microbe now conglomerates with other microbes. There will be the division of labor. Someone will be taking care of respiration, someone of digestion, someone of assimilation, someone for the circulation. And that's how we are equipping the so-called small living organism is equipping itself to realize that ego which is coming from within. And at last as a human being, that's the apex of the biological evolution where we can realize that it is impossible to express the infinite through the finite. So human being is the own mirror at last where you can find that the self cannot be expressed through something which is finite. It is after all just a reflection. The self is always eternal. Our attempt to realize the infinite through the fin finite is futile. It can never be because the finite is a flow. And infinite is always infinite. It is this association and identification that resulted in that ignorance. And from that ignorance, this biological evolution started. But the human being is the apex where he can realize that. It is never possible. And it is not needed also because I'm already infinite. And that speaks of that sense of detachment, growing a sense of detachment. And from that comes the yearning that I have to detach myself from the flow and to get established in myself. So this detachment is possible only as a human being. And from that, the next thing comes, mumukshuta. The Vedanta says that it is true that the absolute or the infinite is trying to express itself in the finite. But there will come a time where it will find that it is impossible and then it will beat a retreat. This is the word of Swami Vivekananda. It will beat a retreat. And this beating a retreat means renunciation, which is the real beginning of religion. And from that comes that yearning, mumukshuta, that you really try, as we find in other religions also. In the Bible, the Christ says, he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. So he says, he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. So there comes a time when the mind awakes from that long and dreary dream. The Swami Vivekananda in his lecture called Maya and Illusion, to quote him, what he's saying, there comes a time where the mind awakes from the long and dreary dream. The child gives up its play and wants to go back to its mother. It finds the truth of the statement. Now Swami Vivekananda is actually quoting a sloka from Vairagya Shatakam. That, what is that? Na jatu kama kama naam upabhoge na shamyate havisha krishna vartmeva bhuya eva abhivardate. The desire is never satisfied by the enjoyment of desires. It only increases more, just like fire. That when butter is poured upon it, it flares up. Similarly, thinking that I can uh, satiate my desire through enjoyment, it is just like pouring butter into the flyer. It will still flare up. It will never get satiated. That's why it is called anala. Anala means unalam. Alam in Sanskrit means satisfaction. When you are satisfied, you say alam. Enough. But fire, it is unala. It's never satisfied. The more you pour, the more it flares up. That's why it is anala. So that's what our desires are like. So he understands that. And then comes that retreat. And from that retreat speaks of that mumukshutvam. He's yearning to get established in his self. Now in the journey, now where the role of the Mahapurusha Shankaraya comes, 
that even if there were no illumined soul, if the entire spiritual journey was left to the human being, we would have went through that realization that nature is designed in such a way we all are bound to be liberated today or tomorrow. Just if you take if you take a number of men who is without any culture, you leave them on a, just on an island, and just you give them the something basic thing for the sustenance, the food, clothing, shelter, you will find that gradually they are evolving higher and higher. They, they are that as a human being they are bound to evolve, but it will take a long time. Just like a plant, a seed if you plant it will grow, but there are ways I can hasten the growth. That speaks of the agriculture, that speaks of the cultivation and agriculture. That we have that signs to accelerate that growth. Similarly, as a human being, our this journey to our this eternal nature can be accelerated. If we leave it to the hands of nature, it will happen. But it can be accelerated. How? There comes this Mahapurusha Sangstraya. The true the spiritual culture which we have developed through ages, through so many realized soul. If I become associated with the lineage, then all the things which the past has went through, I can recapitulate them very quickly. It speaks of theory of recapitulation. In biology, there's a wonderful theory called theory of recapitulation, that the human being is the most evolved being. There are many ways to prove it. One is one of the ways this theory of recapitulation which speaks of the study of the embryo if you study the embryo you can find that which creature is more evolved the more the creature is evolved in the embryo you will find that the entire process of evolution has been traversed at a very short time if you take a human just like the human embryo that first in the embryo it is just a single cell in nine months, it takes the form of the entire human, a human being. At some point, we would find, if you study the embryo, at some point we were like fish, sometimes we were like amphibians, we were like the, uh, these birds. We had a double-chambered heart, it became three-chambered, and then it became four-chambered. We were like cold-blooded animals, then we become like warm-blooded animals, we had a tail. We had the gills, which gradually got converted to lungs. If you study the embryo, but in nature, it took millions of years to evolve from the single cell to human being. But in the mother's womb, it is happening in nine months, which speaks of the uh, ladder in, of evolution in we, which we are. That the more evolved you are, the what you say that the successor will precede the, all the path followed by the predecessor. Ontogeny repeats phylogeny. That's what is called the theory of recapitulation. Ontogeny, the successor, the student, the next generation, the present generation, that is the ontogeny. Ontogeny, that's uh, what you say, that is phylogeny. The parents are the phylogeny. Ontogeny repeats the phylogeny in a very quick succession. The entire process of evolution is traversed in a very quick succession. It's just like the booting of a computer. The, this owning the computer is not the same like owning a light. When you also own a light, it just the moment you switch it on, immediately the connection is there and it starts glowing. But the computer doesn't uh, get on that way. There are various programs which is. Uh, uh, are there, very softwares are there. When you own the computer, it's called booting, that one will be kicking the other, that will be kicking the other, so you will, you will find it always takes a little time. So there is also a recapitulation. All the things which you have uploaded there, it boots one after the other to activate the entire computer. So this, in, in the process of evolution also, it's the booting up. The entire process of evolution is booting up. So what happens in the biological level in mother's womb continues in the intellectual level when one is born as a child. He goes to the school until he reaches the higher secondary level, class 11, the 12th standard. You will find he has acquired the knowledge which the human society took hundreds of years. 
when the laws of gravitation was discovered then this uh, later on the genetics everything that one by one all the knowledge which the human civilization took hundreds of years that small child in the school is going and learning in just 10 to 12 years so this speaks when the teacher is there to deliver the knowledge which you have already acquired the student can accelerate the process of learning same thing is happens in the spiritual journey when you follow the tradition the tradition of the realized souls you can get the advantage of the evolution of the entire spiritual process which took hundreds of years in a very small time and that's why mahapurusha sanskara is very important it's not that we alone without the help of mahapurusha won't be uh, able to go to that spiritual realization but it will take a long time we can accelerate the process we need not uh, wait for the nature to do it for us we can accelerate the process and for that that once you have the yearning you go to the proper source where that the fund of knowledge is there to be what you say that opened up to be just uh, delivered to me to and you can easily accept because you have the yearning and then that spiritual uh, uh, evolution the resulting in the culmination of realization it culminates the, that becomes possible so that's why shankaracharya in the second sloka uh, third sloka is saying that these three things are again rare manushyatyam mumukshutvam mahapurusha sanshraya once you have it it can enable it can accelerate the process of spiritual journey which might have taken some innumerable births it happens in this lifetime so that's why they are rare and they are precious so that's how shankaracharya starts this uh, this treatise the vivek charamani the importance of the human birth and once yearning and reaching the source uh, the sources the all the illumined souls who have already traversed the path when you reach them the spiritual unfoldment is bound to happen so with this we stop our discussion today and then we will continue that shankaracharya will elaborate this idea of this the need to yearn for spiritual evolution in a few more slokas and before he proceeds to the main contents of the treatise that we will take up again in the next class so with this we stop our discussion today thank you all namaskars